Hi everybody, thank you for coming to my channel. Let us listen together introduction. Uh, I'd like to share something with you um, again. But this one is from the uh, Messianic uh, perspective. Actually, there is the uh, Christian Jew Foundation Ministry, okay, in San Antonio. And it's Dr. Gary Hendricks. I do recommend his uh, his teaching, and I'm, like I said, I associate with different organizations, and I also, those, most of the organizations I associate with, I also support them, because I believe we're on the same par when it comes to theology, and so that's why I do enjoy, and I'm sharing with you right now from Gary, from the Christian Jew uh, Ministry. I'm you know, I've known him for many, many years, so uh, I have over here on the board it says heaven. Actually, the question is, have you ever heard the term heaven on earth? And uh, I have to, when I read this, I said, that is different, completely different. So that's why I'm intrigued to share with you what he says, okay? So uh, <clears throat> he says, uh, it's supposed to portray something perfect and idyllic, as in her new job was like heaven on earth compared to her old one. Uh, this phrase, however, is more than mere hyperboreal. Uh, hyperbo uh, it is a prophetic picture of heaven's future location, a real, physical, tangible place right here on earth. When I read it, I said, on earth? I was interested about how he will come to that point. And it's, I, it's always intrigued, you know, to learn more. And that's why I always believe, uh, you know, to read different books and be associated with different organizations. And as, as long as we're on the same part when it comes to theology, especially about the gospel and, of course, the doctrines, uh, I like to read the stuff. So I'm reading to you this, okay? And uh, Let's, I hope some of the words he used I've never heard before, so I will say the best I know and I will spell it to you because you have to, uh, you know, excuse me about that. He said, um, are you shocked? Have you always thought of heaven as something air and eternally real yeah, that exists up in the clouds somewhere? If so, don't worry, you're not, <laughs> you're not alone. Many believers are surprised when they begin to discover these heavenly truths in God's Word. This physical world isn't evil or bad. God created the world and pronounced it not very good, but very good. And you can all my scriptures in the back is in Genesis 1:31. Later, the creation was uh, uh, transcritically trans marked. Uh, and sent into a tailspin by the fall of Adam and Eve, rebe uh, Eve rebelled against God and submitted to the devil. You can read it also in Genesis 3, 6. It's true that the physical world came under a curse of the fall, and it's in Genesis 3, 17, 19. But that curse was temporary. It will be reversed gradually over time during the coming of the during the coming of the millennium, and you can read it in Isaiah 65, 25. While they were in the Garden of Eden in their unfallen uh, condition, fellowship with the Lord, when he came to visit each evening, Genesis 3, 8, Adam and Eve were experiencing heaven on earth. The Bible tells us uh, precious a uh, little about their pre-fall life in Eden. It doesn't even tell us how long they were there before the fall happened? Could be what? Days, weeks, maybe years. We don't know. What we do know, however, is that the fall changed everything. Nonetheless, those original Eden-like uh, conditions will be restored someday when the Messiah, Jesua, Christ, reigns from the uh, Davidic uh, throne in Jerusalem and begins to neutralize the effect of the fall. 
are, he says, are we thinking like pagans? So then, where did the idea come that this physical world is bad and that we can't wait to leave it behind and enjoy spiritually bliss in heaven? Believe it or not, it is an idea that is rooted in a pagan concept known as a dual, dualism. When a believer dies, for instance, we say, well, he is in a better place now. And that is true in a certain sense. But let's forget that our departed loved ones, if they're believers, are coming back to this same old world someday. You can read it in Zechariah 14.5. And 1 Thessalonians 4:14 4, and Jude 30, uh, 14. Here's how paganism has influenced our thinking about heaven. First, consider the idea that there is something evil or wrong about this physical world. So when we wait uh, to leave this it behind and graduate to a higher, more perfect spiritual plane in heaven. Their thinking is misguided. In fact, it is a uh, Christianized uh, variant of ancient heretical uh, Gnosticism. Gnosticism. Yeah. Gnosticism. Uh, ancient Gnostics saw the material world as flawed and evil. To them, the non-material was preference or prefer preferable. They prefer the better, okay? So, by the way, Gnostics are still around. To this day, they dismiss the Genesis account of creation as mytho uh, mythological, uh, and they reject the histor historical of the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The book of Genesis, however, uh, sets the record straight and tells us that God created the cosmos and pronounce it very good, Genesis 1.31. Yet, Gnostics thumb their noses at scripture and insist that the physical world was created flawed and imperfect. True perfection is to them, to them is non-material. Wow. I'm learning some things too, you know, so it's good. So that's why I'm sharing with you, you know, the beautiful part of how people with different knowledge, you know, will share uh, biblical speaking. Uh, second, the no uh, this notion uh, about graduating via death from earth to a higher spiritual plane in heaven is rooted in ancient uh, Plat yeah, Platonism. Here, what the New Testament writes, research professor of the New Testament in, at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, and one of the world's leading biblical scholars has to say that leaving earth and going to heaven is basically the Platon Platonic worldview. You find it in in, in uh, Plutarch at the end of the first century. The normal Western narrative is about safe souls going to heaven when they die. That is not the biblical narrative. The Bible ends with the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven to earth so that the dwelling of God is with humans. Heaven is God's space which is designed to be married to earth at the end. What a statement that is. See, all those things I, I never heard of before in that aspect, okay? Planet Earth was designed to be the place where God and man would dwell together forever. You can read it in Psalm 23, 6. It will be the home base from which we will explore the, the galaxies and beyond. Where is heaven now? If all is true and heaven really is tangible and down to earth, it raises an interesting question. Where is it now? Heaven obvious isn't here on earth. Just look around. All of this of all the pain, injustice, conflict, rampant sin, and death, and that's much uh, become abundantly clear. It is not here. So, if heaven is supposed to be here on earth, why isn't it here now? 
<laughs> Interesting, eh? The answer is that we are currently in a in interim yeah, interim interim period uh, interim period between the devil's defeat at Calvary and the messian a messianic king's return to establish his kingdom on earth. In first John three eight says he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. That is true. Okay, now uh, let's go a little further and see where we're going over here. The manifestation of Son the God took place uh, in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. He was born to a young, a young Jewish virgin named Mary and her betrothed husband, Joseph. He was not a son of Adam, which would make him a sinner by virtue of his possession of the Adamic DNA, because Joseph wasn't his biological father. It's only time in history that the uh, Adamic uh, lineage was broken. Every other human being ever born has been a direct descendant of Adam, but Yeshua was conceived in Mary's womb by divine intervention. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 1.18. So he broke down okay, certain things. The Messiah, uh, Messiah's uh, first coming to deliver the fa uh, fatal blow at Calvary. You can read it in 1 John 3.8. Interim period of uh, AD 30%. The uh, defense, I think how you pronounce it is um, F-A-N-G-E-D defense or defense, but still dangerous, devil continued to be the prince of the power of the air. That is true. You can read also in Ephesians 2, 2, and 1 Peter 5, 8. Messiah's second coming, to bind the enemy for a thousand years. You can read it in Revelation 22, 21st 2, excuse me. Uh, at the end of the millennium, Satan and his followers will be defeated and cast finally and forever into the lake of fire. And you can read it in Revelation 20, verse 14 and 15. So, where is heaven? The New Jerusalem during this uh, interim period while the devil continue to be active down here on earth? The answer is that we don't know exactly where it is. However, we can come to some sanctified guesswork. We know, for example, that at the beginning of the millennium, the New Jerusalem will come down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Revelation 21 2. Since it's come down from above, we can safely assume that its current location is somewhere above the earth, in other space. It may even be in a different dimension from our own. So it would be visible from the earth even, so it wouldn't be visible from the earth even if it was hovering overhead. Like the moon, for instance, who is 25, two, no, 235,000 miles away. Another clue may be derived from the Lord's ascension back to heaven some 40 days after his resurrection. Luke calls, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and the cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. 
So it's here written in X9, uh, uh, X1, 9 till 10. So the Lord's return to the New Jerusalem by ascending upwards and disappearing in, into the cloud or in a cloud, if heaven is situated in another dimension, that cloud may have been some sort of dimensional portal or doorway that uh, facilitate uh, travel between heaven and earth. Interestingly, the Apostle John said he received his vision of the book of Revelation through a door standing open in heaven, Revelation 4.1. Could the door have been a dimensional portal of some sort? It is a possibility, but again, we don't know for sure. Very interesting, right? So, uh, I will read, uh, let me see now, a little bit more. I did not write down the scripture, so you have to... Uh, I was already full over here. Okay, walking dog, uh, death. Sometimes people ask why if the devil has been vanquished in Hebrews 2, 14, he still walk around like a rowing, roaring lion and causing mischief, 1 Peter 5, 8. It is a great question. Think of it like, like this. We're told that many predators in the wild kill their prey by a process that ends with access to uh, access to nation that is death from blood loss the predator even is not in a hurry simply bites or claws its victims and then patiently follows the bleeding animal until it finally and inevitably loses consciousness, and drop over death. During this process, the prey can do its best to evade the predator, but it is no avail. The predator is patient and knows it is only a matter of time before its next meal is served. What an analogy, eh? The fatal blow to the devil was delivered at Calvary. He is still on his feet, but he's been bleeding out for the past 2,000 years. So, his doom is inevitable. Wow! He is, in a sense, walking dead, because it's only a matter of time before he meets his final and certain demise. Do I even know the demise? D-E-M-I-S-E. What an analogy. Very good, okay? Restoration of all things. So then, the Bible says a millennial age is coming when the devil will confine for a thousand years in the bottomless pit. Literally the abyss, okay? Revelation 20, verse 1 and verse 3. During this millennium, as we see earlier, the curse of the fall will be reversed. The New Testament refers to this period of renewal as the times of restoration of all things. I didn't write it down, so you have to follow the, you know, write it on yourself. You can read it in Acts 3, 21. Everything that was lost due to the sin of the first Adam will be restored by the last Adam, Christ, or Jesus, the Messiah, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. At the beginning of the millennium, the new Jerusalem, along with the throne, uh, the thrones of the inhabitants, will descend from heaven and take its place in the Middle East. You can read it in Revelation 3, 12, uh, 3, 12 and 21, 2. It will be a magnificent spectacle. This turning point between the end of the tribulation and the beginning of the millennium will produce a completely new phenomenon described by Isaiah as the new heavens and the new earth, Isaiah 65, 17 
in 66 verse 22. What Isaiah, uh, Isaiah describes is no mere overhaul of the old world order, but rather something completely renewed. Clearly, these new heavens and new earth aren't in a future post millennium eternal state, but are in a reverence to the millennium itself. The context where the reverence in 60, uh, Isaiah 66 22 occurs is clearly the future reign of the Messiah when priests and Levites, verse 21, will preside over the sacrificial system in the Millennium Temple, Ezekiel 40, 48. We know the earth itself will still be essentially intact despite the references of the Tribulation War. The Millennium prophecies mention many geographic uh, landmarks that will remain on the new earth. You can read it in Jeremiah uh, 31, 38 to 40, including identifiable uh, nations like Israel, Egypt, Syria. We are also told that the uh, process of cleaning up and rebuilding after the Tribulation War will require up to seven years, Ezekiel 39.9, which takes the cleanup through the remaining of the tribulation and well into the millennium. So, now let's go over here a little further and see what he had to say. Now, does new, get this, does new means it is not the same. Does new means it is not the same. Well, let's find out. Some scholars say the Greek word for new, kainos, is K A I N O S, as in new heavens and earth, means the previous earth will be destroyed and a new one created. With all due, due respect, however, that's the reading more in to the Greek than what's really there. Yes, kenos can mean something completely different and brand new, but not always. Bauer lexicon, uh, yeah, Bauer's uh, lexicon, for that example, says everything in the next world will be new, in the sense that what is old has become absolute and should be replaced by what is new. In, in such a case, the new is, as a rule, superior in kind to the old. Anthony Hookman explained that kenos is this context doesn't mean the emerge of a cosmos totally other than the present one, but the creation of a universe which, though it has been gloriously renewed, stands in continuity with the present one. Well, elsewhere, in fact, when Paul says a believer comes a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17, he used the word kenos. That surely doesn't mean we aren't ourselves anymore. In fact, that's the whole point. We are still ourselves, but by God's grace, we have been renewed from the inside out. We have new priorities and new purpose, a new position, and a new power working in and through us. Ain't it beautiful? So, I will stop right here. I will finish next time, okay? Because, like I said, time is run I'm running out. But it's so beautiful that through different theologians and how they, when I say theologians, they, they put their faith in the Word of God and explain to us from different angles the meaning of it. And it's true. 
as you become, when you're born again, you become a new creature in Christ. You have a new nature, completely different than from Adam is. So here is the beautiful part, what he's trying to get across to us, the word new. Okay? Thus new means it is not the same. You see? So I hope this will help you, and be patient. I will finish it, you know, and it has some beautiful outcome, may I use the word. And so that's why I'm going to share with you, because I'm excited it's something new. And yet, because, you know, as knowledge, ex, you know, get better and better, so the same thing in theology. And it's beautiful to know that God appointed certain people with a certain knowledge to show His Word more in depth. And so we should be excited that God never leave us in a nice way, in the dark, so to speak. When you really study the Word of God, you, you can really see God's love for humanity. And He has a purpose. And very soon, as I told you before, the rapture will happen, Christ will come, for his church first, and then he will come, and what? He will then reign, you know, the uh, thousand year on the earth, while Satan is what locked up for the thousand years. So be alert, be patient, wait, and I will say then, you know, um, if you like, uh, when you got out of me, give me a thumb up. If you like to subscribe, ring the, not not the notification bell. And I will say then, until next time, God bless you. Bye-bye now.